بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so we continue on with hadith number 16 عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن رجلا قال للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أوسني قال لا تغضب فردد مرارا قال لا تغضب رواه البخاري On the authority of Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه A man came to the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and said Advise me He the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said Do not become angry the man repeated his request several times and he, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, advised him, do not become angry. Recorded by Al-Bukhari. This hadith was actually recorded by Imam Al-Bukhari with this wording, likewise by At-Tirmidhi, by Ahmad, Al-Bayhaqi, and others as well. And you'll notice that the wording of the hadith, it plays a small difference as we'll come to see, bi ta'ala. In terms of a general understanding of this hadith, this hadith continues with this segment of good character that we've been referring to in the past four or five ahadith. That Imam An-Nawi rahimahullah's goal in compiling these 42 ahadith was to bring together a compilation of every aspect of Islam. So you have an aspect of aqidah, which is the first few hadith. Then you have the aspect of akhlaq, which is the middle few hadith. And then there's a third section that we'll get to towards the ending of uh, his hadith as well. So we're still on that section that focuses heavily on good character. Now, one of the great scholars of hadith that we've referred to in the past was al haytami And when he commented on this hadith, he says, you look at the few words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you see its profound effect. He said if we were to ponder just upon the immense amount of benefit that can come as well as the great amount of harm that can be prevented through this hadith, people would have taken this hadith much much more seriously. And that's what you actually notice from the man that when he comes to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he keeps asking the same question, O Messenger Allah, advise me it seems, from what we see um, from the hadith at least, is that this man didn't think this advice to be too great, that it wasn't sufficient for him, he needed something greater than this, and that is why he kept asking. But in reality, when you look at how much harm comes from anger and how much you know, uh, greatness can come from preventing anger, this hadith it actually has a tremendous effect as can be seen. So that's just a general commentary on the hadith. In terms of the narrator of the hadith, he is Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, who I believe a lot of you should be proficient in his biography now. But just to summarize, summarize his biography again, he was born 17 or 18 before the year of the Hijrah, and he died 59 years after the Hijrah. He is someone that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua for, for his memory. And likewise, he is the companion that narrated the most amount of hadith. His name before Islam was Abdul Shams, and after Islam, it was Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhr al Dawsi, and he became very commonly known as Abu Huraira due to how frequently he was seen taking care of the cats and the kittens. Now, moving on to the text of the hadith, the hadith starts off by saying that a man came to the Messenger of Allah. Some of the narrations actually mention the name of the man. But those narrations are actually weak. The authentic version of Al-Bukhari, it just says that a man came, meaning that his identity is not actually known. In the version of At-Tirmidhi, when you look at this hadith, the man didn't come to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and say, advise me. He actually said, teach me something that will not be difficult for me and I will be able to keep it in mind. Teach me something that will not be difficult for me and I will be able to keep this in mind. Now this is a very important characteristic of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and this is something that we want to try to bring back into our own lives is this uh, element of asking for advice. You know in our day and age we will only ask for advice if we're troubled by something. So we have a problem, we don't know how to solve it. Okay let's go and speak to someone and get advice in terms of how we can solve this issue. But you notice the Sahaba radiallahu anhum 
they used to come regularly to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and ask general questions that were on the same level of advise me. So some of them would say, advise me, O Messenger of Allah, teach me something that only you can teach you and no one else can teach me. O Messenger of Allah, what is the best of deeds, meaning the best of deeds that I can do. So these are general you know, characteristics that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were very enthusiastic about and this is something we need to bring back to ourselves. So whenever you're in the company of a learned individual, whenever you're in the company of someone that you can benefit from, it is a very good characteristic to develop that you ask them for advice. For perhaps it is something that you did not know about yourself that you will learn, or perhaps it is something that you did know but you had forgotten about and thus you will be reminded. So you'll always be in a, a beneficial state when you ask for advice. And this is why the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Dhariyat, He tells us, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَةً تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And remind, for indeed a reminder benefits the believer. Meaning that it is only the believers that are constantly looking to be reminded. That or it is only the believers that are constantly looking to be reminded. So now when this man, man comes to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he says either advise me or teach me something that will not be heavy for me, um, the scholars mention that he was looking for advice from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is a characteristic that we should develop for, for ourselves. Secondly, the scholars mention that his constant questioning of this, uh, uh, you know, of seeking for advice shows how enthusiastic he was for this. And this is an, an enthusiasm of self-development, of wanting to improve and wanting to get better. Now this sort of enthusiasm will only stem from a person recognizing and realizing that we all have weaknesses that we need to work on, right? So taking time out of our lives uh, and reflecting upon this, and as something that, you know, what the early predecessors, or at least from the early Sufis, they called muraqaba. You know, looking upon yourself, what are the sins that I'm constantly falling into? What can I do to solve those problems? This is what this man was looking for. Because he knew that the Messenger of Allah would be the best individual to do this. Now, uh, Al-Haytami, he comments on this and he says that possibly the reason why the man kept asking this question was because he didn't see any significance to the answer of the Messenger of Allah wasallam. And he mentions that it is also possible that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, knew that this man had an anger problem and that is why he kept reminding him, do not become angry, do not become angry. But his conclusion in this hadith is that both of these points are inaccurate. That the man, you know, not taking this hadith seriously, that is inaccurate because he was from the Sahabi and he understood, you know, the heavy wordings of the Messenger of Allah but rather he was just enthusiastic for more advice. And likewise, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, only giving this advice because he knew that this man had an anger problem is also not true because the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he knew that these words would be recorded and that they were heavy in weight and that they would go on to benefit many, many people around him and you know, later generations as well. So the statement of la taghdab, do not become angry. The scholars derive from it three different interpretations that we want to reflect on bi ta'ala. Interpretation number one is that this hadith is saying that you need to take all of those actions that will help you not to become angry. So that is what the, the, the taqdeer of the hadith is. That you need to take all of those actions that will help you and prevent you from becoming angry. That will help you, you know, fight off that state of anger. So what are some of the things that the scholars mention that a person can do that will help an individual um, control their anger? The scholars mention five things of which we will share with Allah Ta'ala. Number one is saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. So when a person starts to become angry, it is at that time that they should seek refuge in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from a shaitan. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he once saw two men arguing and one man lost his cool altogether. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told this man, should I not teach you something which if you were to say it, it would help you overcome, you know, this anger that you are feeling. And he said, of course, Ya Rasulullah, and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught him to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Number two, the importance of staying silent. The importance of staying silent. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he advised people that when they become angry, they should remain silent. 
That the Messenger of Allah وسلم, says that whenever one of you becomes angry, then he should remain silent. And you notice the wisdom behind this that, you know, how many relationships are destroyed and how many things are said in anger that can easily be prevented if a person chooses to remain silent. So when you become angry, just remain silent, shut off, and you'll notice how many problems are saved. Things like divorce, things like cursing, things like, you know, taking oaths that we can't live up to, right? All of these things are done in a state of anger, especially the issue of divorce. People think that, you know what, if I get angry and I divorce my wife in a state of anger, this divorce isn't going to count. And in reality, that's not the case. I want you to think about this logically. What type of man divorces his wife while he's ha in a state of happiness? He's like, you know what, I'm happy today, I'm going to divorce you. And the divorce doesn't work like that. Divorce only happens when you get angry. In the few instances when scholars have mentioned that divorce will not count, when a person becomes angry, it's when a person gets to, into such a state of rage that he no longer has control over his actions or what he says. And even then, when the, the Qadi is making a judgment on this individual, he will ask for secondary evidence. That is there any proof that outside of this incident of divorce, did you ever get into such a state of rage where you lost control of what you were saying and what you were doing? If that can be proven, then this will be accepted in the court. If that can't be proven, then the claim of rage will not be accepted as well. So obviously divorce is a very heavy thing and that a lot of the times it happens when it's in a state of anger. And when it happens in a state of anger, the sunnah is completely neglected very, very unfortunately. There are certain procedures that need to be fulfilled before divorce can take place. Meaning that a man shouldn't have had intercourse during that time. A man should not divorce her during her menstrual cycle. You know, these sort of things, uh, they should have taken other precautionary measures, like the separating of the beds, the advising of one another, you know, leaving some distance from one another so that they long for one another. So all these precautionary measures all go out the window when an individual gets angry and they divorce their spouse. So this is something that should be kept in mind. So that's the second piece of advice that remains silent during that time. The third piece of advice is change your physiological state. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he says that when one of you becomes angry, then let him sit down. And if his anger is still not subsided, then lay, let him lay down during that time, and then his anger will be subsided. And this is something that you will experience in your own life, that the, in a more relaxed uh, state that you become physiologically, the less emotion you'll feel during that time. So when an individual is sitting down, he's going to feel less emotion. When the person is laying down, he feels even less emotion. But a full person will be in full emotion when he is standing up, when he is standing up. And the Messenger of Allah taught us to sit down in that situation. Number four, and there's a difference of opinion on this hadith, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he says that uh, it is indeed shaitan that incites anger and shaitan was created from fire and nothing cools down fire like water so whoever gets angry let him go and make wudu let him go and make wudu Shaykh Albani rahimahullah he considered this hadith weak but other scholars they considered this hadith to be hasan other scholars considered this hadith to be hasan and it was implemented by some of the predecessors and this seems to be a sound advice sound advice from two aspects number one is that when a person goes and makes wudu, especially with cold water, this does actually help them cool down. So it helps the body cool down and will help the person cool down. But where I consider this advice to be strongest from is the angle that a person leaves the room that he became angry in. So an individual, let's just say Rizwan and I, we get into a fight, we get into an argument. Here in the musalla, our egos will tell us, stay where you are in that same position and fight your opinion until you win. Right? That's what your ego will tell you. But logic and what Islam will tell you, you know what? Leave the argument. It's not worth it. Everything that you're fighting for at the end of the day is not going to be worth it. And that is why just leave the room altogether and then solve this issue, solve the problem when both parties are cooled down. When both parties are cooled down. And that is the effect of leaving the room to go and make wudu. That is where I believe it is strongest from. So even if the hadith is not authentic, leaving the room from personal experience is something which is very, very valid. That don't let your ego get into the way, control your anger, leave the room when you're cooled down, come back into the room, bi ta'ala. And then number five, and perhaps this can be one of the most effective methods, is that look at all of the detrimental effects 
that anger has. And then likewise, look at all the benefits of controlling one's anger. And we'll get into the benefit, benefits of controlling one's anger in a little bit, bithnillahi ta'ala. In terms of the detrimental effects, we've all experienced it. You know, that time where someone sends you an email and you're responding to that email on the spot when you know you shouldn't be responding to that email. And how many detrimental effects come out of it? Perhaps you get fired from your job. Perhaps someone gets angry at you. Perhaps a relationship gets ruined. A lot of things can happen at that time. Likewise, an individual, you know, uh, when they get angry, it's not just about, you know, the relationship being lost at that time, but it's about what happens even after that is over. So even after that is over, something called hiqt develops inside of the heart between two angry parties. And this concept of hiqt is a very dangerous concept where a person starts hating another individual. So anytime you see that individual, you feel like making dua against them, you feel like harming them, you feel, you wish that you know, bad things would happen to them. All because you got angry at them at that first time and you didn't resolve the issue in a proper way. So hiqt develops. And that is like the after effect that is you know, much, much danger, much, much more worse than the initial conflict itself. So that's what it leads to as well. Now, when you, uh, the fifth and last piece of advice that the messenger of, that we you know, would like to implement in terms of the good things that a person achieves when he controls his anger, there are many, many things, right? There are many, many things. So some of the things that a person achieves when he subdues his anger, is that he attains the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in Surah Al-Imran, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and race towards the forgiveness of your Lord and a paradise. A paradise whose expanse is the distance between the heavens and the earth, prepared for the muttaqeen. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions two things. The forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and paradise itself. And paradise itself. Prepared for the muttaqeen. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes on to define who the muttaqeen are. Right? الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives the, the following characteristics that they are the ones who give in times of prosperity, they are the ones who give in times of adversity, and they are the one, ones who control their anger, who try to subdue their anger, and they are the ones that pardon people. They are the ones that pardon people. And then the fifth and last one is that these people strive for excellence in everything that they do. They strive for excellence in everything that they do. So who can repeat the five characteristics? Besides Munib, who's memorized the verse? Istikh. No, not those characteristics. The characteristics of the muttaqeen. What are the characteristics of the muttaqeen we just mentioned? Sorry? No, istighfar is not one, one of them. Backbiting. Inshallah khair. Inshallah khair. Fantastic. So there's two of them that they give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of prosperity and in times of adversity. The one who controls their anger. Fantastic, the one that controls his anger. And what's number four? Uh, forgiveness. He pardons the people, fantastic. And number five? Uh, strive for excellence. Excellent. He strives for proficiency, for proficiency and excellence in everything that he does. So this first verse, it teaches us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared paradise and forgiveness for these people, has prepared paradise and forgiveness for these people. Number two, um, in terms of, you know, this is like, subhanAllah, this is like the, 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 the dream of like every man. And you'll notice why the Messenger of Allah particularly addressed this to the men is because it is particularly the, the men that have an issue with anger. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, مَنْ كَظَمَ غَيْضًا وَهُوَ قَادِرٌ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْفِذَهُ دَعَاهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عَلَىٰ رُؤُوسِ الْخَلَائِقِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ حَتَّى يُخَيِّرُهُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْحُورِ الْعِينِ مَا شَاءَ that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whoever restrains his anger while he has the ability to implement it and act on it will be called by Allah in front of all of the creation on the Day of Judgment and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will give him the choice of any of the Hur al that he wishes. And SubhanAllah, this is like, you know, when we talk about rewards, 
as uh, for, for most men, their ultimate vision of you know, Jannah and enjoyment in Jannah is you know, having a choice of the Hulul In. And here the Messenger of Allah is saying that when you have the ability to act upon your anger and you choose not to for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will invite you in front of all the creation on the Day of Judgment and will let you choose the Hur of your choice at that time. Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he comments on this by saying, and this just isn't like a one-time thing, meaning that if you controlled your anger, you know, a thousand times in this dunya, that this will only happen to you once. No, but rather for each time you controlled your anger, then you will have this invitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is almost like, you know what, look for opportunities to get angry so you can control yourself, so you get this privilege from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. So that is from the virtues of it. Number three, is that Islam recognizes the strong person to be not the one that is physically strong, but the one that is able to control their anger. So as, ma as men, we're very egotistical. We always want to be you know, the strongest person in the room. We always want to have you know, the most amount of testosterone. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us, لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِالسُرْعَةِ إِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ That the strong person is not the one who can put other people down physically, but rather the strong person is the individual that can restrain himself in times of anger. So you want to be the strong person, then learn to control your anger during that time. So those are some of the uh, things that are recommended to do when a person gets into a state of anger. To repeat them, bismillah ta'ala, number one, he should seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a shaitan. Say, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Number two, he should remain silent. Number three, is that he should change his physiological state. So if he's standing, he should sit down. If he's sitting down, he should lay down. Number four, even though there's a weakness in the hadith, it is implemented by the people of the past and experience teaches us to be effective as well, is that a person should go and make wudu. And this has two benefits. One, the cooling down effect of wudu. And number uh, two, is that you change the room that you got angry in, so that it'll help subdue the anger that you feel affiliated with that room and affiliated with the person that's in that room. And then number five, the importance of understanding and knowing the dangers of anger as well as the virtues of restraint. So that is the first view that when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said La Taghdab, it means do all of those things that are required to help you control your anger. Do all of those things that are required to help you control your anger. Number two is that the second view in terms of understanding La Taghdab is that a person should not act while he's in a state of anger. A person should not take any action at all while he's in a state of anger. And this is related to the verse in the Quran in Surah Al-A'raf verse 154 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Musa عن موسى الغضب, that it is when Musa السلام, you know, lost his, uh, meaning he stopped becoming angry and took action. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised. So here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling us that look, when you become angry, don't take any action at all. And this is something that we've addressed in the previous part, per pre previous view as well, is that taking action in a state of anger has detrimental effects. You will say things you don't mean, you will do things that you shouldn't do, you know, becoming uh, obscene, becoming vulgar, hitting things, punching things, all of these things that you shouldn't be doing, you know, while in a state of anger, that is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam meant, that do not take action while you're in a state of anger. And then the third view is, that a person should not become angry altogether, okay? The third view is that Islamically, you're not allowed to become angry. And this is where the dispute amongst the scholars actually took place. Is it haram to become angry? Or is it haram to act upon the anger? So certain groups of scholars said that just becoming angry within of itself is something which is haram. Because this is from the characteristics of, a, of a shaitan. That as shaitan, uh, one of with the characteristics of shaitan is anger. And here you're being told, do not develop the characteristics of shaitan, which is anger. According to the majority of scholars, they said that anger is a natural human emotion. And that one of itself is not haram. But what does become haram is acting upon that emotion. And it is at this time that you want to look at, you know, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create certain emotions? So we as human beings, what benefit do we get out of anger? What benefit do we get out of anger? 
And when you look at this from a psychological perspective, as human beings, what we get out of anger is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this as a defense mechanism. So whenever you feel threatened, whenever you feel harmed, the body naturally goes into this state of anger. And it is during the state of anger that your adrenaline flow increases, your testosterone flow increases, and your body is capable of doing things which it normally wouldn't be able uh, to do. So when a mother sees her child in danger, she becomes angry at that time, and she's, be able to, she's able to protect her, her child, right? She becomes quicker, she becomes stronger. So that is what anger is meant to be. It is meant to be a defense mechanism that we defend ourselves with. However, the flip side of this is that when you do have this defense mechanism, then it can also be held against you if you don't use it in its proper state. So now, with that having been said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, the opinion of the majority seems stronger. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't naturally incite something in us that is haram. And anger is no different from other emotions. So Islam does not hold us accountable for feeling desire, but Islam holds us accountable as to how we fulfill that desire. So same thing with anger, Islam does not hold us accountable for getting angry, but rather Islam will hold us accountable for what we do while we are in a state of anger. What we do while we are in a state of anger. Looking at the example of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and relating it to his anger. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never got angry for his own sake, but rather he would only get angry for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And you actually see this implemented in his very life that Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he was the servant of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you find on certain instances that, you know, being a young child, he would just go and like goof off. He's on a task from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he just disappears. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to find out what he's doing, and he's like playing around with the ball with the rest of the, the kids on the street. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't get angry with him, but rather he joined in and he started playing with him. And this is why Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he could confidently say that I served the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for 10 years and not once did he say off to me. Not once did he say off to me. So not only did he like never show he was discontent, but he never even said anything out of a state of anger. And same thing with any of his wives, you never saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam getting angry for, at them for something which related to their personal relationship. If he ever got angry at them, it was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. It was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And this is why, you know, it's very important to, when we look at examples, that this element from the life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is taken as well. That when we do get angry, it should never be for our own sakes, but it should always be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll notice that this is where people will go to extremes, that you'll have a group of people that, you know what, they get angry at each and every single thing. Someone looks at them the wrong way and they're getting angry, you know, why is this person looking at me? Getting rid, you know, angry for useless and petty things. And then you have the exact opposite extreme that, you know, something, someone from their own family member is committing, you know, the fawahish, they're not praying, they're doing all sorts of crazy other things that are against Islam, but they feel no anger and no ghira for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. And there needs to be that fine balance. That when it comes to anger, anything pertaining to this dunya, know that it's not worth getting angry over. It's never worth getting angry over this dunya. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can easily replace anything from this world for you. So whatever you lose, whether it is money, whether it is a spouse, whatever it may be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will easily replace it for you. And at the exact opposite time, do not become so apathetic, do not become so passive, that when it comes to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that a person feels no anger whatsoever. When you see your fellow you know, brothers and sisters being killed across the world for no other reason than Islam, this should be you know, inciting anger into you. And this anger needs to be channeled in its proper way, that you know what, we should do what we can to raise awareness for these issues. I don't know if a lot of you know this today, but the first uh, murder in the name of Islamophobia in England took place yesterday where a woman who was just you know, wearing regular hijab, walking down the street, you know, a bunch of hooligans came and they killed her as a racist hate crime. That, and this was the first, crime, uh, the first killing crime in the name of Islamophobia that, that, that was done. And this is something that should anger us, that you know, this woman's crime was nothing other than she was a practicing Muslimah. 
Now it is up to us that once we feel that anger, we channel it in its proper ways. One, creating awareness about it. Number two, exposing the, you know, the, the, the fruitless plots of, of, these races, of these racist xenophobes. Number three is you know, making sure we're creating awareness for the good character that Islam promotes and the khair that Islam brings about in communities and these sort of things, right? But to fight, go out and you know, fight these people and go above the law, then this is not from Islam. Islam is actually opposed to those sort of things. And then again, the exact opposite being, you know what, is just another murder, you know, who cares, it's no big deal. This is against Islam as well. As Muslims, we need to have that, that hatred for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And murder in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something great. You know, whoever kills one person, it's as if he's killed all of mankind. And the blood of a human being is more sacred than the Kaaba itself. Right? So these are all things that need to be kept in mind. And you want to see how would the Messenger of Allah وسلم, react in this situation. So that balance always needs to be found. And that balance is never get angry for ourselves, but let us always get angry for the sake of Allah when it is required. And then let us channel that anger in a way that it is most effective. Let us channel that anger in a way that is most effective. In concluding remarks uh, of this hadith, there's a couple of things I want to mention. Number one is the dua that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make. Uh, Ibn Rajab Rahimahullah, he reports that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to frequently say, أَسْأَلُكَ كَلِمَةَ الْحَقِّ فِي الرَّضَى وَالْغَضَبِ That, O oh Allah, I ask you of a truthful word and a good word in times of prosperity as well as times of anger. And this is something that's very important that you'll notice in times of extreme prosperity and in times of anger, a person loses focus on the things that they say. But here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi he used to supplicate to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala keeps his tongue straight and firm in times of prosperity as well as times of adversity. Number two is that Al-Hasan Al-Basri, he has a beautiful statement. He says there are four characteristics that if one possesses them, Allah protects him from shaitan and forbids the hellfire for him. And uh, forbids the hellfire for him. These four are found in the one who controls himself while in a state of craving, while in a state of fear, while in a state of lusting, and while in a state of becoming angry. And Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he comments on this by saying that these four are the path to every evil. These four are the path to every evil. So those four characteristics again, is a person who is craving, a person who is fearing, a person who is lusting, and a person who is becoming angry. So when a person craves, it means you see someone else that has something and you start to desire it. So this incites something in you to take action that you shouldn't be doing. Number two, when a person is afraid, when a person is afraid, their body starts to shut down. And those actions that they should be doing, they don't do. So when they have an opportunity to make change because of fear, you know, they completely shut down and they don't do it. When a person is lusting, and perhaps in our times, this is one of the most important of them, that we live in such a hyper-sexualized hyper society that we're constantly told, you know, look for instantaneous gratification when it comes to your lust and desires. And this is opening a great path for evil as well. So in the, in, when you live in a society where lowering your gaze is not encouraged, where you, when you live in a society where you're encouraged to in, over intermingle with the opposite gender, where you're encouraged to flirt and this is considered like, you know, group activity or st and stuff like that. It's absolute nonsense. So that is the third thing. And the fourth is becoming angry, becoming angry. And we've discussed the detrimental effects of anger. So Ibn Rajab says, these are the path to every evil. And you want to contemplate upon this, subhanAllah, Every evil that takes place in this world will come from one of these four. That either a person desires something of this dunya and that's what coveting is, or a person is afraid of something, or a person becomes angry, or a person has a lustful desire. Every single evil will come back to these four, subhanAllah. So that was the second thing. And then the last thing uh, I wanted to mention from this hadith is that when you look at um, the issue of Anger. The issue of anger is such a driving force that, you know, we're told in this society that, you know, all, you know, just do what you feel, right? Doing what you feel, it, it has its adverse effects. And this is something that, that needs to be brought attention to. That, you know, this emotion of anger, when you look at how many things have gone wrong in the world, you know, a lot of it just had to do with anger, 
right? Wars are started due to anger, a lot of the times, right? People kill people due to anger. People steal from people due to anger. People oppress people due to anger. People will hit young children due to anger. You know, all, sort of, all, all of these things, they're a result of anger. And Islam, it pays such a heavy emphasis on controlling this one emotion. In fact, I do not know of any other emotion that in, in terms of internal emotion that is given as much uh, attention in the Quran or in the Sunnah as anger is, right? So this is something that we need to pay a lot of attention to and particularly in the gathering of men, since we are naturally prone to lose our tempers and become angry, it is even more so upon us to control our anger ta'ala, and learn from this hadith. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. This will be our last halaqa before the month of Ramadan and next week we will be covering a text uh, pertaining to the fiqh of fasting. Last year we did the, the chapter of fasting from Amdat al-Fiqh and I'm leaning towards doing the chapter of fasting from Bulugh al-Maram. So that will be next Wednesday bithinlahi ta'ala at 8.30. That will be next Wednesday. Uh, at 8.30 with Allah Ta'ala and then we will continue the Imam Nawi's 40 hadith after the month of Ramadan bi Allah Ta'ala with that we'll open up the floor for questions and answers inshallah if anyone has any questions I apologize my voice is low because I actually lost my voice completely over the weekend and Alhamdulillah started to come back and I was actually afraid I wouldn't be able to do the halaqa but Alhamdulillah you know Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala is the best of planners and Alhamdulillah it came through so if any of you have any questions feel free to ask your questions inshallah Yeah. That the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He used to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Allahumma inni as'aluka kalimat al-haqqi fi al-rida wal ghadab That O oh Allah I ask you for a truthful word in pleasure and in uh, anger Anyone have any reflections on anger? Perhaps a personal technique that you have that you know I, that wasn't mentioned that you know we can all benefit from something that you do to, to subside your anger I'll share one thing. There was um, someone that I knew in Montreal that every time he would get angry when we were at his house, he would disappear for like 45 minutes. And we would never know where this brother would go until, you know, one day it was like getting late and it's time to leave. So, you know, the brothers went to the brother's mom and they're like, look, we have to go home. <laughs> we don't know where he went. You know, can you just let him know that, that we're leaving, inshallah. And then his mom, you know, as she exposed him, she let out his secret. Every time he got angry, he'd go and take a shower. So he'd disappear for like 45 minutes and just like hang in the shower for like 45 minutes. And that's something, that's the way he, you know, he would take a cold shower and that's how he would deal with his anger. Go ahead. Driving, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Inshallah, I hope you don't get too, too angry one day. You end up in like Edmonton while you're driving. But no, I agree that works. You know, you put the windows down, you put some Quran on. And you're alone in the car, you drive, and it's very soothing, mashallah. It's very good. Many of you are going to say something? Uh, this is a question I had related to suppressing anger. Yeah. Sometimes suppressing anger too much, for example, in my case, because I get extremely angry sometimes, but suppressing anger leads to me having extreme headache. Okay. So I don't understand medical thing, but how can, it, how can someone find a balance between. You'll notice that between with every emotion, it goes through phases. There's an initial phase of anger where your body's telling you, look, you're about to get angry, you're about to get angry. And then you actually do get angry and then the anger starts to, to decline. And I think in such a situation where when the person does, you know, has, have like medical repercussions from anger, before they even get to that second stage where they do become angry, they need to cut it off at the first stage. So what are the signs that your body is telling you that you're about to get angry? So your heart starts beating faster, your pupils will dilate, you'll want to stand up, you don't want to sit down, right? So those are clear signs that your body's telling you you're about to get angry. So even before it gets to that level, you want to just, you know, get out of the room, go do something different, change your physiological state, distract your mind before you can even get angry. That's what I would suggest. Is it? <laughs> Wallahu <laughs> alam. <laughs> <laughs> People's stupidity, it gets to you. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Yeah, what comes quickly goes quickly as well. Allahu Alam. I mean, what I would say is that there's always going to be certain people 
that they know how to push our buttons. We need to keep our distance from those people. And other times you can just tell even if you don't know the person too well, this person is about to say something which is going to get me angry. So let me just, you know, walk away or don't let this person speak. That's what we should try to do. Wallahu ta'ala. Yeah. Go ahead. I don't know, this is from my uh, <coughs> whenever someone, if, if an anger is being intrigued by someone else, intrigued by someone else, I discover that if you, you allow time without reacting, you will come up with a very good reaction after that. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you're angry now, you, know, you can react. Right. But if you react, then you're going to get fired. Uh -huh. Or you're going to be exposed. It's going to have negative effects for your own self. Of course. If you allow time, the next day you say, okay, let me, let me reply this email. Right. From my boss or something. You'll discover yourself you're going completely opposite. <laughs> Sahih, that's very, very true. Just you leave yourself a buffer zone. And in my life, I think that's one of being, that's been like one of the greatest things that I've learned is that when you're angry, never ever write an email. Never ever write an email. Like it saved so much drama in my life just because 24 hours later, actually sometimes even 36 to 48 hours later, and that's when I respond to the email. And it gives me a completely different perspective. Because you'll notice that when you get angry, your mind shuts down. It cannot look at the complete picture. It's just focused and tuned in on that one thing. So that's a very valuable point. That particularly when it comes to email, always give yourself a buffer, buffer zone of like 48 hours sleep on it. After you wake up, that's when you should respond. That's very true. Jazakallah khair. Brother in the back, go ahead. Uh, you try to take deep breath. Deep breath. Seven, like, try to count it. Seven deep breaths. Well, at that time when you're angry, it is very, very shallow. Uh -huh. But you try to control yourself and take very deep breath and count it. And that also helps you. Sahih, that's very true. No, Jazakallah khair, that's very, very true. I think a lot of the times it's like, for brothers, it's like, how do you get to the stage where you can tell yourself, okay, take heavy breaths so you can calm down. That's where I think a lot of people struggle with. Wahu alam. Any last comments before we conclude, inshallah? Anyone want to say anything? No, yeah, I was going to ask this comment, but it's like, uh, I don't know. It doesn't necessarily relate to the hadith. It's okay. It's a fiqhi issue. Like, I know from my first learning in the past that uh, if you're a traveler and you know that, for example, Bizarre Mamushaf, if you know that you're going to be more than four days there, excluding the day you arrive and the day you are Depart. departing, right. you're going to be more than four days. Once you get there, you cannot shorten your days. Shorten your salah, you mean? You, you cannot if you're going to be more than four days. But if you, have, you, are within, you are within four days, then you can shorten. Right. So I was wondering, like, uh, for those of us who work elsewhere, where we have to go away to Calgary, somewhere far away, where there is Masafal, uh, Masafal Hasar, or whatever they call it. Yeah. Masafat al-Safar. Masafat al-Safar, yeah. Right. So I was wondering, if you, if you are there for only let's say 11 days, but nine days you are there, nine days. One day is the day you arrive and the day you are going. My question is, the day you arrive, even though you already arrived, you know you're gonna be there long for nine days. Can you can you shorten the day, just the day you arrive and, and, and the day you're departing? And say, oh, now I can combine it and I'm going away and probably. Okay. How does it work? Like, There's okay. a lot of details in your question, oh, to, to, but just to keep it short and simple, I'll tell you what's permissible and then I'll tell you what's the, the better, the best thing to do, okay? In terms of what is permissible, as long as you don't establish residency in that land, then you're allowed to combine and shorten your prayers. Okay? For all those nine days I can even... Yeah. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi up to 21 days, we have authentic narrations that he combined and shortened his prayers. Okay? So that is what is permissible for you. The best thing for you to do, though, is that you shorten your prayers, but you don't combine your prayers. Okay? So for example, at the time of Dhuhr, if you're praying by yourself, you just pray two. And then you will not pray Asr at that time, but you'll wait for the time to, for Asr to come, and then you pray Asr in its proper time, and you pray two rakas. That is the best thing for you to do. And if you can pray in the masjid, that's even better. Try to go and pray in the masjid, pray in the jama'ah, in the congregation, that's even better to do. Because when you're constantly combining and shortening, it creates a weakness inside of a person. And uh, you know, this is something from experience. When you travel a lot, you get into the habit of combining and shortening your <coughs> prayers. When you come back to your land, 
Your initial reaction is, you know, I don't like praying full prayers or praying on time because you had this easy exemption. So I would say that if you look at the advice of the scholars of the past, is that the difficult task isn't to pray two or four rakahs. The difficult task is to be consistent with your prayers on their proper time. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the salata kanat al mu'minina kitab al mawquta. So pray your prayers shortened, but pray them at their proper time, be the night ta'ala. And that is the best thing to do. So the residence issue is very, very important. If your residence is here and you work somewhere else, yeah. you can basically, you don't leave there even though it's more than... Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly, yeah. Well, yeah, no problem, inshallah. Go ahead. Adding to that uh, question, if you are returning, are you still considered as a traveler? Okay, so it's, I'll give you an example. So you leave uh, Edmonton at the time just before Maghrib. Mm -hmm. And on the way back to Calgary, the time for Maghrib comes in and the time for Isha comes in. So now there's two issues here. One, are we allowed to not pray on the way, meaning that you completely skip your Maghrib and Isha on the way and pray it when you come to Calgary? And the answer to that is yes. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we pray our prayers then once we arrive in Calgary, once the time has passed? The way you will pray your prayers is that you will pray them in full. So maybe the Maghrib and Isha example isn't good, but Dhuhr and Asr, let's just say. So you're leaving just before the time of Dhuhr begins, and you get here during the time of Asr. So once you get into Calgary, even though you were traveling during the time of Dhuhr, once you get into Calgary, you pray your Dhuhr in full and your Asr in full. And that's what you should do in that situation. Wallahu ta'ala ana. But you cannot combine, you cannot shorten, you just have to... Yeah, you can combine, but you can't shorten. Once you get back, you, there's no longer shortening of prayers for you. Mm -hmm. If you're praying congregation, do you leave the imam after two rakats? Explain. So, for example, you're praying dhuhr shorten and he's praying dhuhr full. So, there's the dhahiri opinion, they said yes, that's what you should do. Is that when the imam sits down, uh, in the second rakah, that's when you should say salams and you can leave the prayer. And they actually went very far. They said you can say your salams, get up, do takbir again, and then join him for asr as well. That is a very, very far-fetched opinion. Very, very far-fetched opinion. Uh, that's not something I would suggest implementing. What I would suggest implementing is that whenever, whatever the imam is praying, that's what you should follow as well. No, no, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. So if you join the salah with the imam, he's praying for, you're going to pray for for dhuhr. And once the four rakats for dhuhr are finished, then you can pray asr after that. That's not a problem. But at no point should you leave the congregation and do your own salah. Wallahu ta'ala. Go ahead. So if you were to join him, if you were late for the prayers, you caught the last two. Yeah. What do you do and do in that situation? Again, there's a difference of opinion. And this is something that, you know, recently Sheikh Walid was in town and we had this issue where, actually, no, sorry, we were in Toronto when the issue first came up, where we got to the, the masjid and the Imam was in the last rakah and we needed to pray dhuhr with him. And Sheikh Walid, you know, he prayed one more rakah after that, made salams, and then he started praying asr. And I'm you know, wondering what is going on over here. But you know, uh, he said that this was the opinion of Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah, that the, the person who's traveling, he's not restricted to the number of the Imam. But he said this should only be done in the case where you know you've missed some of the Salah already. So if you joined with the Imam from the beginning, you could pray completely with the Imam. However, if you know that you missed two rakahs already, then when he makes Salams, there's no harm in you making Salams as well. But that's not the opinion we're promoting. We're promoting stick with the Imam, inshallah, beginning to end. Wallahu ta'ala ala. Khair, we'll conclude with that. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.